Good evening. It's Thursday, May 29th. This is the second and final night of the Hidden Pivot slash Camouflage Trading course. And we're picking up where we left off last night. We're uh, looking at a series of slides that expand on some points that were covered uh, in explicit detail earlier. Uh, the chart we're looking at uh, is a bullish ABC pattern, but you can see on the tail end of it, there's a smaller, a lesser pattern that also projects uh, higher, in this case to the same target. And you might say that in this picture, all systems are go. And as a practical matter, uh, the alignment of these two uptrends gives you a reason to be a more aggressive buyer when the entry signal for this smaller pattern gets tripped. If you're not in the in the trade by by that time, somewhere right around here, where you get an X entry signal on the small pattern, it's one that you should definitely heed and trade aggressively. Um, and uh, a couple things, you, you've got a pretty got up, pretty good odds there with two two distinctive trends driving this higher uh, to reach the target. But also, you'll notice sometimes that when you get in at X, the stock will will take off, and um, and even though uh, you won't know this or you wouldn't have known it up to this point, uh, it sometimes means that that the stock has hit a double entry point because when you hit that X, you should get a little bit of propulsion, and um, when you've got two two or more trends driving it, uh, you, you'll see occasionally a ballistic leap in the underlying vehicle. And uh, let me mention, we've just been joined by uh, Armistead. I'm going to mute you, Suresh, and uh, welcome. You haven't missed much. This was the first slide, uh, Armistead, that we've looked at tonight. And uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand, but I will be having a five-minute Q&A interval following each break at the hour. So we'll take a five-minute break, come back, and before we launch into the next segment, I'll give you an open-ended Q&A. And after the third and final installment of tonight's lesson, uh, we'll have a, a truly extended Q&A session, and I'll just stick around for as long as uh, you guys want to ask questions. I've also uh, mentioned that uh, I've actually rendered the recordings from last night, so if you missed last night's session, they should be available online either tomorrow or, or by no later than Monday, certainly. Uh, this is something I mentioned to you yesterday, Suresh, the idea that uh, we can sometimes bring greater clarity to the picture by extending an imaginary uh, trend in one direction or the other, or perhaps even both. And in this case, you can see that once I've drawn in the hypothetical dotted arrow line there to show where this thing might be going, it brings into sharper relief the symmetry of the, the overall pattern. And uh, I think that the visual effect is to make the target itself more compelling. Uh, here is a, a similar instance, but in this case, I've drawn lines up and down uh, to kind of uh, bring my eye to various big picture patterns that may be at work here. And of course, when you extend the green line, it draws your eye to a possible A down here, uh, an A and a B and a C and so on and so forth. Um, the downtrending red line uh, is congruent with uh, another big pattern, starting with that A up there. Here is a chart that predates the camouflage technique, but it's very much in the groove. You see a couple of downtrending patterns working simultaneously. The uppercase red coordinates here project a target of 41.16. You can see that uh, this stock Newmont Mining took quite a bounce from within a penny of that target. But you can also see that on the way down, after we had registered a point C on the big pattern, 
uh, another smaller pattern sets up on this five minute chart and y y you'll probably see at first glance a pattern that starts up here A, B, C but if you look closer you'll see a couple of things here that we should like to take advantage of namely the existence of some very sharp single bar coordinates. This is a nice discrete and distinctive low right here that I've labeled uh, lowercase b in purple and similarly we have a very sharply drawn delicate point C high and uh, you may notice as well that it meets a lot of our requirements for perfection. Um, we've got single bar coordinates on all three uh, ends. We've got a nice impulse leg that got past a, a real internal low right here and a real external low right, right there. So it's a really good impulse leg and the fact that it plays out so quickly, you just had a few minutes for that high to start dropping down again and trigger you in at X, but that's a, a very high probability trade here because again you've got two downtrending ABCs pushing this thing at the same time and the fact that this uh, this smaller one has defined itself visually in a way that accords with our our ideal uh, it, it's a, a great place to get short. Uh, here we've got a matrix and I mentioned uh, the name of my mentor earlier, a fellow named Ira Tunick. He was an options trader on the Pacific floor but he had come uh, from a background of uh, construction. He had his own construction firm and uh, when he semi-retired in Santa Rosa he realized that he was going to have to uh, generate some a consistent and reliable return on his nest egg. So he did a search for about a year uh, into various trading systems and Lindsay's Trident is what uh, attracted his interest. But he came to that already as a Zen master of cycles analysis. He was a pretty good technician already and uh, he was applying principles that were spelled out by a fellow named Hearst. Hearst's book on cycles is uh, the definitive work on that topic and uh, Ira and I diverged in our methods probably about 20 years ago but uh, his incorporates the um, dynamics of, of cycles analysis uh, it gives him a better handle than I have really on the time element within a trade. We're, we're pretty good at finding the exact price where something's going to turn, but Ira using cycles analysis has a way of confirming that uh, as to when it will happen. And uh, it's a good trick. Uh, I would say that you can incorporate any of your own bag of tricks uh, with the hidden pivot method. It never hurts. I try to keep it simple. I'm really kind of lazy in that way and I like a system that's price oriented with no oscillators, no volume bars, no anything really. I, I keep it as simple as possible but I'm not going to deny that if you can bring a, a different type of technical logic into your analysis and trading that it will not benefit you. So uh, be my guest but I would caution you uh, against being seduced by trading systems that would promise to make it easier. This is probably the single biggest um, stumble, stumbling block for someone, for, for students that I've met, and I've, I've met literally, I've met a thousand of them uh, over, over time, or actually thousands, plural, and uh, if I had to single out the most uh, crippling problem, it is this uh, propensity to be seduced. You're, you're halfway into learning one system and then you, something else comes along and you think, well, geez, this looks like magic. And you kind of drop your learning of uh, the one system and shift over to the other. But I would suggest before you incorporate uh, your own tricks into the hidden pivot system that you take the time to, to master it. Uh, it will reward you. All right, so getting back to the matrix, my uh, friend and mentor Ira liked to come to his desk in the morning prepared to trade. And in order to do that, he prepared what's called a matrix. A matrix is very simply 
uh, an amalgamation of all the A's, B's, and C's that you can find on a chart. And up till now, we've dwelled on the patterns that showed the most promise. But I want you to be aware that whereas we might say, well, we've got an A here and a B here and a C there and a D there, uh, sometimes we see obvious ABC patterns. There are alternative ABCs that will work to some degree. And by that, I mean that you can you could take a pattern A, the, the, the big A there, up to B, B, C. But you could also take as a tradable pattern A, and you could use that as B, and that as C. Or you could even go A, B, and C. So they're all valid to some extent. Uh, but typically, we're going to be looking for the one that is going to give us the ultimate D target. Um, so, I with one nice feature of the uh, spreadsheet calculator that you should have gotten in the mail from Maryland is that it allows you to put in many ABC patterns uh, on the one uh, on the one page. So let's take a look at uh, how we took all of these ABCs and we plugged them into the spreadsheet matrix. All right, so here we have uh, two calculations, as you know. We do a window calculation and a target calculation. The window calculation is usually not that important. So uh, we'll look just at the the um, target calculations. And there, I've taken the ABCs, all of the different permutations of A, B, and C from the other chart, and I plug them in here. And the object of this exercise is to put within a pretty small, to succinctly summarize uh, the entry prices, the P midpoints, and the D targets. And as it happens, if you have coincident P's, you have uh, ABC patterns of varying degree, but you see that uh, two or three of them have an entry price at around the same, at the same price or close to it, you have a powerful argument to to get long at that x, that multiple x. And by that same measure, uh, if you see that a few there are a few p's that are within a point or two of each other, that implies that uh, there's going to be considerable stopping power at or near that number. So the matrix, there's no uh, nothing difficult about it or magic, but if you are uh, that sort of trader, if you like to come to your desk in the morning, uh, with some ideas kind of ready-made uh, and, a, and a kind of a, a prior analysis of everything that's going on, then it's, it's, it's useful. It's a useful, useful discipline to prepare a matrix each day. Um, oddly enough, the example that I've chosen, we really don't have much in the way of coincident X's or P's or D's. But uh, this will give you at a glance the pl the prices where you should be paying attention during the course of the day. All right, this is a big piece of the hidden pivot course, and I've referred to the midpoint pivot to earlier and uh, done so in the context of a, a little trick that is very useful analytically. Uh, the one thing that I mentioned that you should have firmly in mind right now is that good strong rallies, dominant bull trends, tend to produce corrective ABCs that don't reach their D targets, but which in fact reverse from the P midpoint, from the midpoint pivot. So uh, there are quite a few other things that we can deduce from the midpoint, midpoint pivot and some uh, tricks that are directly applicable to trading. But let's take a look now in depth at uh, the midpoint pivot idea. Uh, they enable us to accurately predict trend strength. You're going to see quite a bit of that uh, in, in some forthcoming slides. Uh, we can use these pivots to initiate trades with very tight stops. And uh, this is something we looked at just briefly yesterday, the idea that price action at the P midpoint, the P hidden pivot, corrobor corroborates and validates the D targets of whatever pattern uh, they they are part of. All right, this chart, I've kept it around for, for quite a few years, eight years. It's a weekly chart. And it's uh, what's going on here, as you're about to discover, 
is pretty amazing because even though I expect some uh, the P midpoint, the hidden pivot effect, to play out very precisely on charts of lesser degree, it's somewhat unusual when you see it play out to the penny on a long-term weekly chart such as this one. Now, before we get into this chart, I want to just ask one thing of you, and that is that you pretend that you don't see anything to the right of my cursor. In other words, I want you to look at this as I go along from one bar to the next, and uh, I want you to pretend that you don't know how everything turned out because uh, we're going to go along the pattern and see that at certain points we're going to be able to make certain assumptions, but I want you to make those assumptions organically and at such time in the development of this price pattern as, uh, as that assumption is warranted. All right, so we're, we're down here and we've got a pretty nice rally that kind of works its way higher and it starts to come down, down, down and by that time, by the time we're here or here, we're getting a pretty good idea that we've got a good A, B impulse leg. And of course, we've got a very short KA segment right here. So we know we don't need much of a pullback to get into the window. So we're actually, uh, we've actually terminated the impulse leg by the time we pulled back to around here. All right, so it keeps coming down, 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 down. And when it starts to rally, perhaps to here, we get in our in our mind's eye the picture of a, an ABC pattern, A, B, and a potential C. So we know that C actually comes to exist when we've rallied enough, when we've rallied from some low that's in the window, a distance of 25% of this AB leg. So that's actually, uh, in a mechanical sense, where we would get long on this trade. It would be somewhere around here. And I'm just taking 25% of this AB a, leg and visually adding it to our point C low. So this is about where we get tripped in and about where point C becomes manifest. So as it's going up, 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 we realize we're getting probably close to the P midpoint of that CD leg. Um, and uh, the P midpoint calculated by simply taking half of the AB leg and adding it to C. So we know it's somewhere up in here. And when we're around here, we want to actually do the calculation to get ready for the trade. In this case, because we're looking at a long-term chart, um, there are a lot of things we might be wanting to do uh, with the knowledge of where that P is. And uh, one of those things might be, for instance, to do covered rights against a long-term position. So in this case, the P midpoint is ideally suited to that goal because uh, if, if there's going to be a stall, if this uh, big, big rally in the stock is going to take a, a breather, uh, the most logical place for that to occur is at the P midpoint of the CD leg. So when it gets up near that P, we, we, we've been holding a thousand share position, let's say, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, or over the last 6 to 12 months, when it gets close to that P, we should incline toward doing some covered rights perhaps, or depending on your needs, you might even think you'll exit the position there and take your profits. All right, whatever the case, you can see that we got a very precise and powerful effect at that P midpoint, because when the calculated P is at 1443, and when the stock reached that price exactly, it took a major header. Uh, this bar doesn't look like uh, look too bad, but if you look at it in percentage terms, the stock fell from 14.43 down to ten dollars and change. So, in that respect, you can see that um, that Silver Standard took a major. It was a major correction from precisely the P midpoint from the P hidden pivot or hidden pivot resistance. And um, a couple things we can conclude at this point. Uh, we don't have a crystal ball. So when this thing hits P and starts to fall, that comes as no surprise. In fact, we, we more or less expected it. However, we do not know whether this thing's ever going to get past P. For all we know, as of around here, 
that P might be the, the highest high we're going to see for the next 10 years. Or, on the other hand, uh, P could be hit, and then the very next day, this thing could go uh, blowing right past it, uh, which I will mention, incidentally, is a very good sign that uh, the real strength is still there. There's a lot of buying power percolating under the surface. All right, so what happens eventually, we come down here, and we finally break out past this P that was such a, a an impediment. And at, at that point, at the top of this bar here, we know a couple of things. We know that uh, now that this thing has actually exceeded P, that it is logically going to be presumed bound for the D target of the big, the big pattern here. And one other thing that we can infer is that if and when this thing finally reaches the D target of the big A, B, C pattern, that it's going to be... Uh, it's going to correct from that D target with the same sort of preciseness that you see in the correction from P. So in that sense, price action at P is predictive of price action at D. So the fact that we've got a stall to the exact penny at P uh, is tells us we, we've got the right pattern. This is a pattern ABC that's correct. It's going to have consequences that we can uh, be pretty confident about when uh, the stock finally gets to the D target. All right, a few more charts. Let's take a look at some of the other implications of price action at P. Now, looking at the big picture, we see a downtrend in this chart, and it's not exactly obvious. You know, there's a lot of twists and turns, and the thing that's visually most confusing is that uh, we've got an A up here and a B down there, the rally to create a point C takes us almost up to point A. So in that regard, it doesn't look like much of a downtrend, but it is. As long as A is higher than C, you've defined a downtrend, and you've done so in a way that you can measure. You can assign coordinates to those highs and lows. And once you've done that, it'll give you an X where you can get short and a P where you can look to see what happens and eventually a D target. All right, so what we see here, the first time that we made a C, and we're starting again on a down leg, the follow-through leg, and the first time that that downtrend interacts with the P midpoint, we can see that it's sliced right through it. Now, the pattern and that point P aren't chopped liver. They're real. We used real coordinates, and even though the ABC quality of this pattern is very gnarly, it's not at all intuitively ABC-like, we know we've got the right numbers plugged in here, and that P really does exist. We're not, we're not imagining that it's there. And so when this thing slices right through it, well, we don't conclude that, uh, well, geez, this doesn't work. I mean, there's P, and what, what happened? It didn't work at all. In fact, it did work. It, what it did was show you that the downtrend is so powerful that the P midpoint hidden pivot support events no support whatsoever. And because of the way this thing just blew right through P on its first uh, contact with it, we can pretty much conclude that this thing has enough selling power to drive it all the way down to the D target, 1261. And a couple things I'm going to mention, because this will come into play when we talk about camouflage trading. Because of the way this thing blew through the P midpoint, it behooves us to get short. It's basically said, hey, this thing's going all the way to D. So within this, uh, this forest of up and down bars here, we should be looking for ways to get short. Uh, a lot of ways to do it. One way would be to get down on a two or three minute chart and look for a little ABC pattern and perhaps go short at P. Because remember, if, if we're in this nice powerful downtrend, any little ABC rally in here is not likely to reach its D target. It, it, it should in fact stall at P. Um, but we have options of, to get short by shorting either P or D. And one other way you could get short would be a purely mechanical uh, dynamic, and that would be to say, well, if I get short at P at 1276 and a quarter, 
I've got uh, 15 points of profit potential if this thing eventually gets to the target. So on that basis, and using the idea that we talked about yesterday, the idea that all trades from entry to exit can be governed by a 1 to 3 risk reward ratio, if we were to apply that in a mechanical way to getting short here, we would simply short 1276 and a quarter, the P midpoint, and we would put a stop loss at 1281 and a quarter, five points above where we got in, because that is one third of the 15 points we stand to make if this thing goes to the target. So that would be a purely mechanical way uh, to, to do the short. This is a very interesting chart uh, insofar as it uh, reflects some of the dynamics of the P midpoint. It's a chart of uh, gold, COMEX gold futures, and um, our interest in the pattern and in trading it might have been peaked, well, let's just say somewhere around here, because when we're here, we've seen this thing make a pretty distinctive sharp high, a good potential B, and we pulled, it's pulled back low enough so that uh, we could get a C down there if it starts to, to rally again. All right. And one other thing, we know if that's a B, we can slide backwards and find ourselves an A. I chose this one here. Um, we talked yesterday about arbitrarily selecting the one offload if there's one available. In this case, there is. Uh, you might say, well, what about this guy right here? And uh, as you'll notice, though, it doesn't quite meet our requirements for being a, a, a low. It, it sure looks like one. It sticks down all nice and, and distinctively. But there's no high. There's no stick up high that precedes it. So this doesn't really count as a low. That one does. So we'll take that as the one off low. So now we've got an A and a B. And you can see it got past an internal uh, peak there and an external there. So it's a good legit impulse leg. And I'm not going to count this little pullback as a break in our impulse leg simply because this pullback occurred before this rally got past any externals over here. So I'm taking everything from there to there as an unbroken AB impulse leg. We pull back to C and when it starts to rally and trips us in, C actually comes to exist. We now label that C. And at that point, we have the three coordinates that we need, A, B, and C, to plug into our calculator to find out the good stuff. We know what the entry price is because it already tripped. But we want to know what, where P is because that would be a logical place for the rally to stall. And we want to know where D is because that gives us an idea of how much profit we have to shoot for if this thing eventually fulfills the ABC pattern. All right, so we do our calculation. And we discovered that the midpoint hidden pivot, the P pivot uh, of this ABC pattern, is at exactly 668.40. Look what happens. It comes right up to 668.40 exactly, pulls back. Head butts it again, pulls back again. Uh, hours later, it comes for another try, can't get through, and pulls back. So th at this point, we have a very, very persuasive and powerful hidden pivot effect. Uh, when I say that, I mean to imply that uh, that this rally, buyers really know, they don't know, but they know that that P is there. P is definitely having its effect uh, on buying. It's stopping the buyers uh, in numerous instances here. So, so that's what I call a very strong hidden pivot effect. 668.40 is definitely playing uh, a significant and precise role in the price action of this gold futures contract. So but it, so by the time we're here, we know, again, we don't have a crystal ball. So we don't know for sure whether that, that headbutting of the P midpoint is going to be the high for gold for the next 10 years. But we do know that if and when the futures finally get through that, that uh, two things are going to happen. This thing is very likely going to get to the D target, and it's going to get there exactly, because just as we had an exact stall at the P midpoint, if and when gold finally gets past P, it's going to go for exactly the D target, the same way uh, that we have exact price action at P. 
And just at the tail end of this, this happened before uh, I even thought of, I'd thought about camouflage, but it worked out to be a perfect camouflage opportunity because the first place where we actually, where gold actually broke through P was right here. And it didn't do it uh, in a very distinctive, pronounced way. Basically, you just had a, a little tick above it, the P line, and then another tick on the next bar above it, and it pulled back a little bit. But you, you can notice there that in that teeny tiny, tiny pattern, A, B, C, we have absolute perfection. You couldn't ask for a better bet the ranch opportunity uh, here. And notice what we have here. Number one, um, like the Elliott Wave guys, when this thing gets even a single tick past these highs here, we recognize it as impulsive. We're no longer in chop, chop, chop corrective uh, price movement. Once it gets above these previous highs, even by a single tick, we've got an impulsive move. And the fact that it has defined itself visually in a way that's so perfectly what we like is it's our great fortune. So we've got a, a good stick down single bar A, a good single bar C right there. A P is ugly, it's a two bar affair, but we only need two of the three coordinates to be single bars uh, when we do camouflage. Uh, you'll notice as well that this is a nice one off A relative to these guys here. So it's got so many things going to it for it. And the thing you need to consider, though, is it all happened within the space of a couple of minutes. So this is telling you that if you're really alert and you're watching for little opportunities that develop just out of nowhere like this one, it's the one trade. This trade can make your week, if not your month, because there's such certainty in getting long uh, at the X and just having this thing take you up to 671. It's, it works out to be an almost riskless trade. All right, here is um, uh, another pattern that's it's pretty to look at. It's a little bit gnarly, you know. I'm calling the move from that high to that low and a straight line AB impulse leg, even though we've got a bit of a bend in the road, a sideways move there that uh, played out over many hours. But I see it as a straight line. You can see also that I've ignored the distinctive A right there and I've arbitrarily and mechanically selected the one off simply because it's there. It exists. I use it if it's there. And sometimes if I want it to be there and it's not, I'll go down to a chart of lesser degree, as you're, you're going to see shortly. All right, so, so we've got A, B, and C. And when we start down here, I don't know. We, we might have uh, used the X entry to get short somewhere around here. But... If we miss the trade and we're looking perhaps to trade against this downtrend, the most logical place for us to attempt it would be at the hidden pivot P of this big downtrend. It's so clear. You know, we've got a beautiful one off A, a distinctive, sharply drawn, delicate B and C. It's got such precision. Plus, P is occurring just like, just as I like it in the middle of nowhere. And by that, I mean, if we look to the left to find some, uh, maybe a structural, a previous low that other traders are going to be looking at, in this case, the P occurs in a, in a place where it, it doesn't really relate to anything that's happening over here. There are no obvious supports. So because P is in the middle of outer space, so to speak, uh, we've got that much more reason to try bottom fishing there aggressively. Because the pattern is just about everything we like, we also have a reason to buy precisely there with a very tight stop loss. We love the pattern, so we can use a very tight stop loss. And um, uh, so it's got a lot of things going for it as a place to speculatively step in and try to buy it. And you can see that the, the way I should have hung with it for a few more bars to show you the nice rally that we got in this NASDAQ mini index contract. But be that as it may, we were predicting the bounce from 1654. It actually came from 1653. So you would have been in within a point of the, uh, the low. And uh, with that, you will have established or would have established an excellent low risk entry point. Um, 
here you see a big ABCD pattern and we almost got to D with this rally here but not quite as you can see though the D target is valid in theory until such time as we get some sort of pullback that takes out the point C with which the D target is associated so here we almost made it to the target but not quite but when we pull back and start to rally the target is still viable in theory and this uh, the, the P midpoint of the big pattern, A, B, C, D, the P midpoint is right here. And as you can see, the pullback came to exactly that midpoint pivot before it reversed. So uh, as I, um, I've indicated here, um, the pullback to a P is sometimes a last really good opportunity. If you missed, missed the trade here on a rally to the D target, uh, you you have, might have a lucky last chance to get in if it pulls back to P. That's just a good place to do it. All right, we're going to actually skip the verbiage here and go right to the pictures. But uh, I want you to come back to this slide number 82 and attempt to uh, visualize each of these rules. I think it's a good exercise to... Uh, come to these rules to come to understand them by reading them and visualizing exactly what they express. So, um, but let's look at the pictures uh, to see what I'm talking about. Now, uh, this goes to that probably the most important idea associated with the midpoint pivot, and that is that good, strong, dominant trends that are likely to reach their D targets tend to produce corrective ABCs, lowercase ABCs, that don't reach their D targets, but which in fact fail at P or close to P. So let's look at that, that uh, idea in the context of what you see here. Uh, among the downtrending ABCs, I picked a good uh, nasty one. I started with an A there and a B, uppercase B and a C, and you can see it eventually reached D. But you can see also that within that downtrending pattern, we had a bit of an uptrending pattern as well, uh, a lowercase a, b, and, and I know, I hope that you're noticing that we, I'm calling an impulse leg here, uh, a, a rally that didn't actually pass the, the required internal and external peaks. In this case, we'll simply assume that it did if we get on a chart of lesser degree, but I'm simply selecting the pattern because it looks so good. It looks so ABC-ish that I'm not holding myself to that rule in this case. All right, so to finish my point, we've got a, a major downtrend, but in the course of that downtrend, we had a corrective rally, lowercase a, b, c, and the D would have been up here somewhere, but you can see that it never, the corrective rally never got to D, it got to P and failed and started down. So in this case, the calculation of P in this upward corrective trend would have given us a great place, a very low risk entry spot for a short that harnesses the selling power of the bear market in, uh, in Goldman Sachs. Uh, chart in IBM has some very interesting details here. Now, as you can see, up, up till here, anyway, the big picture in IBM is bull market. It's just a great bull move with a big red AB move and a, and a CD follow through. However, let's look at what happened in the corrective phase of that monster rally. The corrective phase, uh, one uh, ABC pattern that kind of stands out, that, that does everything we need it to do, is right here. Lowercase purple A, B, C, D. And it's a pretty good pattern because, as you can see, the impulse leg did some of those good things. It went past an internal and an external and another external. And it's pretty nicely drawn, single bar A, uh, just by a hair, uh, good sharp single bar B. So this is a great impulse leg and, therefore, the first piece of, of a very usable pattern for our analytical or trading purposes. But look what it did. We've got the correction of A. B, C, and if it had rallied from P, that would have come somewhere around here, but it didn't. It just kept on going to D. So what we have here is a corrective phase that, that 
that did not reverse from P but went all the way to its D target. And what that's telling us is that there's some perhaps fatal weakness creeping into IBM. And if we were to make an intuitive guess as to what that means, we might say that the ability of the corrective ABC to reach its D target is predicting, it's saying that that the CD leg might fail somewhere along the way, and that in itself gives us a good reason to be uh, to short aggressively at P. As you can see, that trade would have been uh, wouldn't have been a money maker because it eventually went higher, and it eventually got to D and collapsed. That getting to D and collapsed was foreshadowed. It was predicted by the price action by the, the behavior of this corrective ABCD. Because the ABCD did reach its D target, it's telling us that if a follow through leg to the big rally reaches its D target, it's going to be the final gasp of that, of that bull cycle that began here. All right, so this, this chart beautifully illustrates that, and I'm sure that you can, uh, you can see the value of that for purposes of trading. Uh, since I never like to make things too much easier than they actually might be, uh, when, when I look at patterns, and, and you, you'll see them yourself, you'll see, well, geez, this was easy as pie. It's such a perfect ABC. How could you have lost money? How, how, you wouldn't have hesitated. But many times when you zero in on those patterns, you look at them uh, under magnifying glass, you'll see that they were a lot trickier than you might have inferred just looking at the big picture. Uh, when you get down to charts of lesser degree, you'll see that what looked to have been an easy trade was in fact uh, very nasty. So in this case, uh, you can see what might have happened. We've got this big A, B, C uh, rally. And by the time it gets up to here, you know, within a literal hair of our D target, and it starts to drop, we would think, geez, it's over. I mean, this thing, you know, it's, it's in the, the bowels of hell. But look what happened. It took one last rally that actually got to the D target exactly. And you can imagine the psychological effect. Not everybody is, is looking at this rally and seeing a D target up there. But, but you can imagine how the crowd might have been feeling when this thing took a really nasty header, scared bulls to death, and then lo and behold, it lures them all back in with one of the most potent bull traps I can imagine. You know, you can imagine how you would be feeling the day that this uh, stock broke out past what had previously been an all-time high. So everybody's bullish up here, and that's literally true. It's re it's reflected in in the the viciousness. Of, of this collapse, it, collapses like this, by definition, cannot they cannot they cannot possibly occur unless everybody's on board up there. You know, there there are no buyers left up there, and that's the reason why this thing collapsed as precipitously as it as it did. Everybody, everybody, all the bulls got caught with their pants down right here. They were so bullish, having witnessed the breakout above that high, that everybody's in right here, and that is what it made it possible for this thing to say, okay, a couple chops here and we're going to go even higher. And why, when it started to fall apart, uh, you, you reach the point here where some people are starting to get it. They're saying, geez, there's no bottom to this. And we, uh, they create the conditions for the exhaustion bottom down here. Um, we've seen this before, but I uh, another illustration. Uh, we've got a nice uptrend in, in gold. And we see a corrective A, B, C that gets exactly to the P midpoint and gives you a pretty nice, uh, certainly tradable rally of uh, close to 180 or 90 points there in gold. And again, the rally came exactly from P. P would have been a nice place for us to step in and do some bottom fishing there uh, because it's far enough away from the B that all other traders are going to be looking at. Everybody is expecting this thing to come down and test support. And they're all second guessing each other. Some are buying here and some are buying here. Some are buying here. Some are going to wait for a breakdown and a snapback rally before they buy. But they're all vague ideas about stepping in as a buyer 
because we have a very precise price where we can do the same, we should use it. You know, I mean, there are a million traders thinking we're going to get a bounce from somewhere above B, but we don't have to think of it in terms of somewhere above B. We've got a very precise and logical place uh, where we can step in and speculate on a low. Um, here is uh, a, a further illustration of something we've seen before. We've got a big ABC rally going on here, but the first time that it gets to P, it tiptoes right up to P and chickens out. And again, we don't know whether that P, that high just below P is going to be the highest high we see in this uh, Japanese yen contract for the next 10 years, or whether, you know, the, the yen, the contract is going to blow right through it in 15 minutes. In this case, it, it took a while. It took several days. It stalled out at P exactly. So we don't know whether it's going to get through or not, but we do know that if and when it finally does make the move through P, it's got eyes for the D target. Not only that, but because we had a precise pullback from P, we should see a precise stall at D as indeed occurred. And um, one other thing I'm going to, I'm not going to say I'm going to mention it because it's too important uh, an idea, too useful an idea for you. To, uh, I don't want to give you the idea that it's inc incidental. And that is, that we want to pay attention to the way in which uh, P, uh, in, in which the underlying futures contract or stock or whatever interacts with P. So we've got interactions in a couple different ways. Here, we had a stall almost precisely at P, but when it finally got through it, it really ripped right through it. I mean, it went through P with such force that we should have been, we would have been in no doubt about this thing ultimately getting to D. So in this case, when we saw that P was finally, it, it took a while to get through it, but the move that took the rally through P was so powerful, it was so forceful, it absolutely obliterated, it demolished P. That's telling us there's so much buying power that this is absolutely going to get to D. So price action at the P midpoint is descriptive and predictive of further price action of trend of trend strength in that case. All right, so here is um, a, a point that I've made before, but uh, illustrated nicely in this chart, and that is we're we're down here, and we want to find a good low risk place to try bottom fishing in price line, and a logical place to do that would be at the P midpoint of this downtrend. And the problem is, where's P? We don't have any questions with A. A is such a good, sharp, stick-up bar right there, and it's a one-off relative to that high. So we've got such a beautiful A there that we know that's locked in. We don't have to worry about that. However, we do have two BCs here. We've got this BC and a slightly lower one represented by that BC. Which do we use to calculate P? So we start with the first BC, since that's going to be uh, the one, the first P that this uh, downtrend encounters. And it goes through it just a little bit, so we slide down to the lower BC, and it gives us a P at exactly whatever it is, 606.5 cents. And... Um, <laughs> and this, again, is one of those really tricky tricks because as you can see, we might have bought down there and it would have been a good trade. We, we would be able, you can see that with Priceline buying down around 606, we had ourselves a nice, uh, looks like about an 18, uh, a $12 rally. So, so even though we're in prematurely, we see that we went even a little bit lower right there. Even though we might have used that P to get long, it gave us a $12 rally to play with. When it finally came down again, um, and, and actually, I'm not sure, there, there's a possibility that the first rally came off the P that was calculated by this upper bracket, this upper BC. So we could have bought there, and when it, when it came down and broke through it, we could have bought the P that was tied to this second, this B2C2 pairing. But you have to have a lot of discipline to, uh, to recognize, to, to sort of keep in mind that when this thing comes down and it breaks below that, that, that low right there, 
that we've still got support in the form of 1P that's left over from this B2, C2. So we've got a breakdown, and even though you might want to run for the hills right there, uh, you need to stop for a moment and think, well, not run for the hills. This could be a great buying opportunity. It could be a false breakdown beneath that low. And the fact that it can break down falsely and, and, and go no lower than the P midpoint, the, the lower of the P midpoints from these two uh, pairs of coordinates, it makes it an, a, a great place to buy again, to try it again. So you could have made money on both trades, but um, um, and, and as I said, when I drew this chart, I guess I should have accounted for the possibility that that low right there is really the P of the, this upper BC. Uh, this shows in a, an idealized way, something we've talked about before. We've got an uppercase big bull market rally from A to B, C to D, uh, you know, a seven point rally followed by uh, another seven point rally. But we see in the midst of it during the corrective phase, a lower case A, B, C that did exactly what we might expect it to do if we uh, thought that XYZ was in a bull market. Uh, the corrective phase turned exactly from P, and we could have been bought. We could have been buying down there, and once it gets a little bit of loft, once we know it's really going, we we pretty much know. And I use that word in quotes exactly where it's going. It's going to 72. The reaction, the bounce from the P midpoint uh, of this corrective phase tells us this thing is moving very nicely to the hidden pivots that we might calculate and therefore uh, we can see a rally coming to exactly 72. That's a good place to be uh, exiting a long position or perhaps doing a covered right against it if you intend to keep it. All right, this is something like that chart in IBM when it fell apart. Um, we've got a big ABC rally, but we've got uh, by the time we're here, we've already seen a corrective lowercase ABC that that overshot its P midpoint and went all the way to D. And as a practical matter, when we see that correction get all the way to D, it would have made us at least speculatively try shorting at the P midpoint aggressively. In this case, I haven't drawn it as though the P midpoint had any stopping power relative to this CD rally, but we might have expected it to, and it would be a good place to attempt to get short. But it got past P eventually and got to the D target, but as we saw in IBM, the fact that the correction made it all the way to this D target made it logical and for us to infer that if and when the big ABC rally finally reaches the D target, that that would be the last gasp of that big bull cycle that began back here. All right, we've seen this as well. Um, this is a pretty clear illustration of the midpoint effect. We've got a big ABC downtrend. And when it first encounters the P midpoint support, um, it, it takes a bounce exactly from it. And we can see, because it took a couple of bounces precisely from the P midpoint, uh, we see that the hidden pivot effect is very clear, very strong here. And although we don't know whether these couple of lows right at P are going to be the lowest lows we see for the next 10 years, or whether within a day or two it's going to break down, but we do know that because of the precise bounces that we got from P, if and when P is finally exceeded to the downside, this thing is going exactly to 63. Um, in this chart, I've drawn a corrective lowercase ABC correction that, heaven forbid, actually exceeded its D target. And what's that, what's that, what that's telling you is that when you finally get the big CD rally follow through, it's not going to make it to D. In this case, I've drawn it as though it did, but in the real world, you're going to see, this is not going to happen too often, where you've got a corrective A, B, C that overshoots its D target here. It goes even lower. And even though, yes, it did embark on that second leg, the uppercase C, D leg, 
uh, it has such a high probability of failing at P that we shouldn't hesitate to try to short it there. And, and again, don't be confused by the fact that I've drawn this as though it reached D. This corrective pattern was predicting that it would never get to D. All right, let me, I'm going to pause to sneeze here, if I, if I may. All right, sorry about that. I uh, got that out of my system, but there may be another coming along. Um, here, I mentioned when we went along the path of uh, an ABC pattern as defined by Lindsay's Trident, his entry point is right there. And I explained why that entry point is intuitively too enticing and too obvious to be a good one. But suppose we knew that, and, and the enticement to buy there is to some degree dependent on the impulse lag. And let me explain why. If you've got a really good, sharp, steep impulse lag, well, that's as much as saying that it's going to turn everybody bullish. So when we pull back and we start up again, all those bulls who are waiting for a little pullback and then a resumption of the rally, they're all going to get in there. there. But since we're talking about it in that way, doesn't that mean we could just as easily anticipate it in an actual trading situation? So how might we do it? Well, the, the, the logical way to do it is to say, well, we've got such a powerful AB impulse leg, such a promising one, that we know everybody's going to attempt to get in there and they're all going to get stopped out. Why don't we simply let them get in there and we sit on the sidelines and we let them get stopped out and we take the second signal entry point? In other words, we wait for a second point C to be created and we use its entry point. Now, this is such an important point, and it's become more important lately because I see more and more machine trading. You know, there's so many algorithms that are kind of thinking in ways similar to the way we think, looking at ABC patterns, and, uh, and so it's more important. So I'm seeing a lot of patterns that look beautiful, but where if you get in at the first signal point X, you get ripped. It just it sinks and, and you get stopped out. So, so even though that was always a problem with Lindsay's Trident, it's a more significant problem now that we have more machines that are on to the qualities of ABC patterns, some of which are similar to rules that we use. All right, so what I'm going to suggest, and this is an extremely important exercise, is that you set aside a whole day and I could say a month. It wouldn't hurt you to set aside a whole month to do this. Uh, you want to, for an entire day, watch these ABC patterns. And, and when you see one that's good enough where you think, well, geez, this is a trade. I think I want to take this. I want you to take the first signal to X and to make, take notes on how often you get stopped out on that first X. And then I want you to set aside another day for a similar experiment but with one modification and that is I want you to take every single ABC pattern each one that you like enough to actually trade and say I'm going to let the first X entry signal go by and I'll take the second one well of course in many instances the second one will never materialize it'll, it'll go X and then take off like a bat out of hell or it'll hit X and it'll, it'll noodle around for an hour or whatever but the point is, you really have to to calibrate your eye uh, and your trading instincts to the ABC pattern. You have to get your own refined idea of how much of an impulse leg has to happen before everybody's tempted to get in at that first X. And I liken this to learning zone, zone system photography. It's basically a, a way of correlating your eye to see uh, the gray tonal scale, white to black, uh, in terms of how it, it plays out when you're shooting things in color. So leaves of a certain green hue produce a certain shade of gray. But you really don't know what that shade of gray, of gray is until you've fired off 150 rolls of film and seen exactly what sort of gray a beige 
uh, you know, the beige side of a house produces or, or the dark green midsummer leaf of a tree. So you absolutely need to do this. You need to set aside a time to hypothetically paper trade, to, to, to trigger yourself in each time the first X is triggered and then a whole another day to let the first X go by and to trigger yourself in on the second signaled X. The, the, nothing that you do as an exercise is more important than what I just suggested. All right, I'm going to stop the recorder here.